When developing our Rails applications, we have so many options for editors, and that's what we're going to have a look at in this episode. Whether you're a Vim user, or you like VS Code, or one of its derivatives like Windsurf or Cursor, but in this episode, we're going to focus on a different one, and that is RubyMine. It has been out for many, many years, but recently it was announced that it's free for non commercial use. So if you have a side project, then I suggest trying out RubyMine. This is not a sponsored episode from JetBrains, but it is an editor that honestly I've used for many years in the past. But for the past five years or so, I've been using VS Code, and I haven't really looked at RubyMine since. So I'm going to be having a fresh look at RubyMine. It does look like there is an Apple Silicon image, so it should run natively. And there's also Windows and Linux versions as well. So I haven't done any prep for this episode. I wanted to have a fresh look at RubyMine and just capture some of my initial thoughts, having not used it for many years. And I've created a very simple checklist that we're going to be able to go through as we check out RubyMine. So because I'm on macOS, installing RubyMine was as simple as downloading it and then dragging and dropping it into the applications folder. Both Linux and Windows will have their own installation mechanism, but those shouldn't be too bad. But in this episode, we are going to be using Mac OS. So I'm going to launch RubyMine for the first time, and we'll go through the initial setup. And so we'll select the free non-commercial use. It does look like we had to log in, which honestly is the first strike, because when I'm using the editor, I don't want to have to log in. I can't even tell if this login is even for my settings or not. And this isn't a dig on JetBrains, but with the green for the non-commercial use, the usage data to validate your compliance with the non-commercial license terms, I have no idea what that means. I don't know if that means that it's going to be sending over the code that I'm writing, and then it'll use some mechanism to check to see if this is a side project kind of code, or if it's actual business logic for a corporation, or if it just looks at how often I'm using it, if it is within normal work hours. So that's kind of confusing. And the anonymous feature usage statistics for future product improvements, I'm okay with. I don't want to be a complete stickler and stuff because I am using a free product. The main concern is the usage data. It's kind of vague, but let's go ahead because this does fall under the free usage. And we skip the import just so we are using the default settings. And so this is kind of cool. Right off the bat, it is under beta but it does look to have a remote SSH. And so let's go ahead and try to set this up. I have another Mac computer and we'll try to connect to it. And already it ran into a few problems where it supports connections to Linux hosts only. We had to switch to the Toolbox app to connect to remote hosts on Linux, Windows, or Mac, which I'm not going to download and install another product just to do that. So we're not gonna be able to use the remote SSH if we have another Mac we want to control, but we have a Linux VM that we have all of our Ruby interpreter and code on and stuff, then that should work great. So I will give a semi pass for the remote SSH. It's not exactly how I would like it. I really like the VS Code remote SSH because it works cross platform. But I do have a Ruby interpreter on here. And so let's go through and create a new project. We want to create a Rails application. I'll put in my projects folder and I'll call it example Ruby mine. It did pick up my interpreter, which I have multiple versions of Ruby installed. I do use mice to handle my Ruby versions. And it picked up that I have a couple of rails versions. We'll pick the latest and then we can pick our database backend, our JavaScript framework. We have a lot of options. Honestly, I would prefer to see ES build above Webpack. Same for bun, but that's okay. And then we have extra options, which I do like that they give you the extra options with the toast. So we could add something like a CSS tailwind, but then that's all the options we get. I do think that this area could be improved where we do have more options in the GUI, but in general, I think this is good enough for now. It is kind of cool that if you do want a Rails API or a mountable engine, then you have those options as well. But those are literally probably just adding the API only flag or changing the Rails new to a Rails plugin new. But we'll keep this for now. So we've created the project and immediately I get a message, RubyMine goes AI. 
which if it is part of the AI features, I don't know what their terms of service are. And honestly, I'm not going to read through all that, but we can use ChatGPT and we'll just ask if there's anything concerning about these terms of use. And so, and so based on the responses here, it seems pretty standard and nothing concerning, which I like JetBrains as a company. And I don't think that there would be some really questionable things in there. So that's okay. I just hate having that huge wall of text. And so it's created our project. So that's good. And it does look like we have an AI assistant. I don't know if this is agent, but with all nice things, there are people who will abuse it. So it looks like we have to link a credit card in order to use the AI assistant. And then also to use Juni, which I don't know what that is. But I went ahead and added a card off camera. And so it looks like Juni could be similar to the agent where we are asking it to code. But then the AI assistant. It's not really clear what the difference is. So that's kind of weird. I don't know why they need to have two different ones, but let's go ahead and have a look at the application. I'm not going to dive into the actual application because that should be normal as it is, but we can try to get this up and running. So we'll hit the run, which it does launch, and then we can visit our browser and that works. So this is all super basic right now. And I think that you know, all of this stuff is expected. And I think with some time I could get used to it, but some of it's just a bit strange and it seems to be pieced together, like having the two different AIs, Juni and AI chat. But let's have a look at some of the tools. I don't know what the code with me is. Okay, that's kind of cool. So we have a code with me session. Okay, so the code with me is a collaborator session, which does exist in editors like VS Code, where you can have someone come in and actually work on the code base on your computer with you. So it's kind of like a pair programming thing, but they do have a limited amount of time. You have 30 minutes for the free license. And let's say for individual use, the monthly billing isn't too bad. So it's 550 per host. But I just have a fear that this is just for the code with me functionality. Then you had the AI functionality. And so this free version could end up costing you quite a bit because I don't know what other hidden costs there are. So we'll go ahead and end that session. And then let's go ahead and install a gem. So we're going to go under the, the tools menu. We'll go to bundler and let's go to install. Okay. That literally just runs the bundle install. So it looks like I might have to add a Ruby gem, the good old fashioned way instead of running the bundle add, or I could do it from a terminal session. So we'll add it, which I think I would probably use the terminal much more often than trying to go through the menus. Cause I mean, honestly, the menus for a rails application seems to be a bit excessive. There seems to be so much in here, which some of it could be really cool. For example, like converting a curl request to an HTTP request. I think that could be extremely powerful, but let's go ahead and run the rails generator, which it pops up on my screen, but then it disappears. But I can start typing and then that kind of works. Okay, so I just typed in scaffold and then hit it. So we'll give it a model name and then we can use some of its auto completion. But then let's have a content and we want to make this rich text. And there isn't an option for that, which is a bit disappointing because I would expect that either this GUI to be a bit more complete where you're not having to type out the things, they really could have had a model name text box then a list where you can add in your different things. But we'll just go with this for now. Let's also run action text. Maybe we need to run the Rails script, but that's expecting from the script directory. So the Rails generator, that's going to run the Rails generate. So we need to run a rate task. Again, it doesn't give me a GUI. So I just had to type it and then hit enter. And we'll just run this, which it looks like it ran OK. But I think a lot of times I'm just going to be going back to the terminal so we can run our bundle. We can run the bin rails DB migrate. And I mean, while I'm at it, I might as well run the bin dev to start up the rails application, which it was already running within Ruby mine. So I'll stop that and I'll run the bin dev again, which if you do that, it does not tie it to the editor. So on our post controller on the new, let's add a raise. And if we visit our local host, and if we go to our posts, 
and we create a new one, we get the raise here. But in our editor, we don't really get that raise. But we can click on it to go to that problem. But instead, what I want to do is to stop the Rails server. We'll run it from RubyMine. We'll start up our Rails application from RubyMine. We'll refresh the page, which it still gives us the same error, which that's what we would expect. But now it looks like we do get something a little bit different. So back in the terminal, when we got this problem, we literally just got the logs out and stuff. But here, with running it under RubyMine, we got the explain with AI. And it looks like AI is now trying to generate some kind of answer as to why we have this problem, which it just spit out a whole bunch of text. And honestly, a lot of this isn't even relevant. So I don't know if it edited my file or not. Didn't, because it's probably just under the chat mode. So we'll put it under the edit and say, can you fix it? Which may be on their pro version, you're going to be able to get faster answers. But this seems to be a really long generating answer. And a lot of times when I'm using an AI assistant on my editor, I want it to just do what I'm asking. I don't need big, long, lengthy explanations. And I need it to be fast. Because the manual debugging of this, I can go directly to this file see the issue and correct it. Of course, if it feels a bit more complicated, then it would take a bit more to look into. But again, this did a lot of thinking, added a lot of text just to fix that one little problem. So I think that using ChatGPT for one isn't a great option. And it looks like we are kind of limited on the different ones that we're able to use. But I do like that we are able to use a local model which I do have Olama installed so we can test that connection and we can tell it to use the open source version of GPT 120 billion parameters. So let's undo our previous change, which it doesn't look like I'm able to undo it. So maybe by accepting that change. All right, so I've undid those. Now let's explain again with the AI. So it does look like it's now using my local model, which is really cool that they have that. But I do wish that the edit mode that I had in there before, it would have kept that setting. I think part of the problem and what takes it so long in my Olama terminal, I can see that it's passing in a lot of contacts. So it's still running just the same one, but it's making so many requests. And on this Mac Studio, it's pretty quick. So probably it's sending a lot of contacts and just back and forth to make sure that it gives you a good answer, which isn't a bad thing, but it does come at the cost of speed. So we'll give it the same, can you fix it? And we'll see what it comes up with. It answered much quicker, and we get the same result using a local model. So that's good. So we'll accept the changes, and then we should be able to refresh, and then our application is fixed. And so we weren't really able to use a GUI to add a gem. There could be a way, but honestly, there's just so much within RubyMine that's almost overwhelming. I think it's a bit easy to get paralysis by all of these options, which I think is why I liked VS Code initially, because it was very simple. There wasn't many moving parts. You just had your editor and you can make it as complex or as simple as you wanted. But let's switch over to Juni to see if Juni is a little bit different. Maybe this is more the coding agent. So we'll say create a seeds for the posts. So we have a thousand records to work with. Yeah, so Juni is going to be like the Claude code or the agent. And then the AI chat is more like what you have with Visual Studio code with just that editor. And it's still being able to make changes, but it's not going through the reasoning and the Claude code like functionality. Okay, so it looks like it did it. But let's go in and have a look at our seeds file. Okay, we have our seeds post helper. And you know what? Let's just see how it did. So we're going to go to run, maybe the tools. We'll run the rate task, db colon seed with no arguments, and we'll just run this. It said we got a thousand posts. Let's go in and check that out. I'll refresh the page, and we have a thousand posts. So that's great. But this does introduce with the number of posts that we have. That's also using action text. It does create an M plus one query. And so with this M plus one query, it's not even very understanding that this code is going to cause some problems in performance. 
We're not eager loading anything, especially the action text. So we would want it to be refactored. And of course, this refactor doesn't really seem to be doing any kind of actual refactoring, not in the traditional sense. It seems like this is just going to move files around. And I don't want to rely on AI to fix everything. So I would have expected that RubyMine should have picked up on this M plus one query and then given some kind of alert on this index action that there's opportunities to optimize it. So overall, I know that there are a lot of people out there who really like RubyMine and I think that's great. It definitely can be a great tool. And I think that there's a lot of value in it for some people, especially if you're buying into the JetBrains ecosystem with some of their other projects that integration could be extremely nice. But likely, if I were to use RubyMine, what would end up happening is I would use it for a little bit, but then I would see that I need to really be productive with my work, and I would switch back to VS Code or something similar. But this is also coming from the lens of someone who's been developing in Ruby on Rails for over 15 years, and I don't think that's a fair judgment to say about RubyMine. Because, in a lot of ways, I am set in my ways. Being introduced to a whole new editor like this is a bit of a culture shock. I do like some of the quick navigations that they have. With the double control, I can run anything. Or the double shift, I can aim, search for any file. And so I do think this double shift navigation is really nice. I do like the color coding and that kind of stuff as well. But it's still something that isn't that big of a shift from what we have with VS Code or something similar. And another complaint that I had about RubyMine back in the day that still seems to be the case is that the configuration options is just overwhelming. For example, within VS Code, I can click on one of these and then it automatically opens up the file. You have to double click them on RubyMine. I know there's a way to do it. Now I thought it was under this ellipses back in the day, which it looks like it is still there. So now I can enable those. And now when I click on them, it opens up the file. And so that's great. But if I did not know that was there, how long would I have been searching in the settings for that option? So it looks like there's some things under the key map, but I can't find it anywhere else within the actual UI. So that's a bit strange. And overall, again, I'm looking at this from a seasoned lens and your mileage may vary. This is definitely not a dig on JetBrains. It's just one of those things where I did see the announcement. I have a lot of respect for JetBrains and the products that they create. Admittedly, I have used PyCharm in the past, and that has been really helpful, especially when I did not know a lot of the Python syntax. But I think for seasoned developers, the tools that they're using now, they're using because that is where they are most efficient in. But if you are starting out in developing, I would recommend that you do give RubyMine a shot. I think that it has a lot of value. And if it can help you solve bugs a bit quicker and be more productive, then it's a great option for you. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.